seamstress here at Minerva and today I'm going to share with you how I've done my gorgeous princess coat from the charm line of patterns by Gertie. So you can see with the princess coat we have a lot going on. We have this gorgeous rolled collar neck. Um, I've made the one with the beautiful lantern sleeves and we've got that gorgeous full skirt going on and of course the whole thing is absolutely lined. So yes, it is massively overwhelming but it is an absolutely great project to take on to advance and, well, just to, to advance your sewing skills really. A overcoat does look quite scary but trust me, I've broken it down into so many easy steps. You shouldn't have any problems whatsoever taking on um, this magnificent make. And even if you are new to sewing, but maybe not your first project, let's be honest, not your first project, um, but if you're wanting to take on the challenge and you don't mind dealing with huge amounts of pattern pieces and bits of fabric going on, hopefully I can guide you through the process to make your own very gorgeous and simply wonderful princess coat. So what do we actually need to make our princess coat? Well, what you need to do is decide on your fabric because you've already decided that you're going to make the princess coat and you've got the pattern and you've looked at it. So you need your fabric and I've gone for a really beautiful um, vegan wool that we have here at Minerva and I've taken the red just because I like red and I wanted something dramatic and uh, to me it just is the perfect choice. So I've gone with my beautiful red vegan wool um, obviously I've also got my princess pattern then after that I have decided on some gorgeous jacquard um, lining which is a really lovely shot blue um, and the red because I wanted a bit of a spa splash of colour and a bit of statement also on the inside of my princess coat then the next thing we have gone for is the thread must have thread so you've got to get that because that's always something that one forgets then I have got my buttons which are essential and I know predominantly Gertie does say that you do need um, self-covered buttons to keep in with that style of the princess coat but I did go with the beautiful um, leather dill buttons it's just again something that I really liked and that just suits my personality and then we have interfacing and I did get um, a really nice woven interfacing that is, it's a quite a light interfacing. So even though I'm fusing my whole coat, um, the light interfacing is not too stiff and it still allows that bit of flexibility and movement within my fabric so it's not too, too rigid. And then the last thing that I've gone with are shoulder pads. Now, I know you're all going to balk at the shoulder pads because, you know, we don't wear shoulder pads, we're not 1980s. But unfortunately, um, part of tailoring with what I was taught that you do need shoulder pads to help keep that line and to support and to support the top part of your coat. So yes, I think shoulder pads are essential. However, I have picked out some really lovely prim ones that are just going to give you that structure across your shoulder without giving you that 1980s retro look. You will notice throughout my sew along that every one of my seams has been taken to with the pinking shears. And there's two reasons why I do this. One is I like a pinking sheared edge. I can't deny it, I simply do. And then the other thing is through the tailoring process, actually by pinking shearing those seam allowances, you take away um, the sharpness of your seam allowance that can cause a little bit of a ridge. So sometimes you will notice when you're pressing your seams, if you haven't done them um, with a pair of pinking shears, you will have your seam allowance and you'll get a tiny line that little bit away um, from where you've actually, I guess, pressed your seam allowance into your fabric. I don't know how else to explain it, but you do kind of get that line and by taking away or by using pinking shears you take away that visible line so it's not noticeable or you don't notice it there. Now you don't have to have pinking shears to get away from that line. A really cheap trick that I was taught in college is to get a piece of cardboard and actually um, 
place that cardboard, butt it up to your stitched seam. So you've kind of got cardboard slid in that seam allowance, so you've got your fabric, your piece of cardboard and then your seam allowance and then press it. So that actually stops the um, shadow effect of that seam allowance going onto your main fabric. So do go down and grab a piece of cardboard out of a cereal box that you've got in the kitchen and use that trick um, instead of buying the pinking shears if you don't want to buy pinking shears. But trust me, if you buy pinking shears, you will buy them once. Um, buy the best you can afford at the time you are buying them and trust me you will never have to buy another pair again. I've broken my princess coat down into lots and lots of stages and the first stage that I have started with is painstakingly tracing out the pattern. Now some of you are not going to want to do this and if you don't want to do this I suggest you order the pattern as a PDF form um, and cut that out and to your heart's content but if you're like me and you're very much old school and you're quite happy to trace out your pattern it's a really great way to become familiar with this pattern because there are lots and lots of pattern pieces and it gives you a little bit of an idea because you start to look at stuff and go oh how am I going to put that together how does that work so you kind of start to think about the pattern in a bigger sense so what I did was that I traced out all my pattern pieces and I think there's 30, I don't know, but there's quite a lot. There's quite a lot of pattern pieces, trust me. And um, so I painstakingly traced them all out and also that allowed me to grade and tweak my size where it was necessary. So I've got um, my perfect fit um, princess coat from doing that. And then once I finished tracing out all those pattern pieces, I broke them up into sections. So what I did was that I got a few freezer bags and I have a freezer bag for my bodice, a freezer bag for my sleeve, a freezer bag for my skirt, um, another for my lining and another for all the odds and sods, random little bits. Um, that you come across that don't really have a home because they're just one little random bit. So that's a couple of bits of the facings and the buttonhole bind and different things like that. So I segregated out all my patterns, um, popped them in the freezer bag so that it was so much easier to actually um, take on the make because it did seem a little bit less daunting. So what are the essential other items that we need to complete our princess coat? Well if you are going to trace out um, every one of your pattern pieces you will need um, tracing paper. So the one that I always use and keep a stockpile of is the Berda tracing paper. That's my personal favourite but any tracing paper um, that you're happy to use is brilliant. Um, bear in mind you will need some large pieces for those skirt um, panel pieces. Pieces, um, if you're not going to cut up your actual pattern. Then the next key thing that you do need is actually some organza to finish off the backs of your bound buttonholes. So I was quite lucky enough, um, I knew I had some organza knocking around in my stash and freakily it was actually an orange red kind of shop bit that I had um, that actually went really well with my coat but I wasn't trying to match it, it was just something that um, I did have in my stash at home. So um, you will need some organza, only roughly about a 30 centimetre square. So have a little bit of a look if you've got something suitable within your stash um, or nip out and just get a little square or by half a metre or whatever you want to do with that. So that's the other essential thing that you will need. And also you do need um, a piece of muslin of some description that will go um, across the back of your inside of your coat that is referred to as the stay piece. So that is the other thing that you will need, a piece of muslin or again I've just gone stash busting and found a nice piece of bright cherry red navy that I had in my stash and I just used that. Then some of the other really useful elements um, that you want to consider buying or purchasing to help make your princess coat 
um, assembly process really easy is your is a sleeve roll which is really handy for when you are doing sleeves um, a pressing ham the pressing ham I would say is fairly essential um, because it does help when you're pressing the curves over the bodice um, and through your sleeve when you're manipulating it through this part of the lantern sleeve as well so a pressing ham is really really key um, then the next thing I will say is a random selection of scissors and we've already spoken about the pinking shears um, and the pros and cons of having pinking shears and not having pinking shears so pinking shears would be the next um, your fabric scissors or maybe just a slightly smaller pair of fabric scissors just to help trim back um, those seams when you've got to grade those seams and the other thing that I will say is a tiny pair of um, straight um, scissors so a little pair of embroidery scissors or something that's just a really straight um, edge to them because that will actually help to cut in um, through the bound buttonholes when you are doing them and you've got to cut in the back and by having a nice small pair of sharp scissors you're not going to overcut and create any tears uh, because if you've ever cut into a bound buttonhole after you've actually done them all you'll know exactly what I mean um, because then you have to buy more fabric and start that piece all over again so yeah the five quid that it takes you to buy a small pair of very sharp scissors is 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 really worth it then the next thing that i use that i absolutely love is my prim pencil i've used so many different pencils um, across my time sewing this is my favorite one it's like a retractable little chalk pencil like you used to get as a clicker pencil um, but it's a chalk pencil so it comes with leads and different colored chalks um, I actually have three different ones I have a lead one um, and also I have my white chalk one and I've got a pink chalk one as well um, and I just used that um, which is really handy because you do need to mark in the back of your bound buttonholes with a little window that you will see through the video um, and I just find this particular um, retractable prim pencil actually gives me a really polished finish um, and it, it gives it, it just gives a better definition and a sharper line and as I say it's one of the best ones that I've ever come across and again it's a really good investment and then the last thing that you will find that is really really handy is a ruler and if you haven't got yourself a dressmaking ruler or perhaps even a quilting ruler um, again do invest in one because you will find that you will use it not only for your princess coat make um, when it comes to just marking in some of those seams that you need to be super accurate with um, it's something that you will just use all the time and again it's a really handy thing to have in your kit um, to start or just generally to have in your kit um, as part of your sewing tools when it came to actually assembling my princess coat i went completely rogue to what gertie recommended as her instructions so the first place that i actually started was my skirt because I just wanted something really easy to sew I didn't want to have to think about it and even though Gertie recommends the bound buttonholes as her very first instruction um, it can scare the heebie-jeebies even out of the most seasoned sewers and I just wanted somewhere really easy to start and let's face it it's a circular skirt it's got to drop anyway so you may as well do the circular skirt first off get that done get that hanging up out of the way um, so it's got plenty of time to drop and you don't actually have to think about it or that step at the end when you're getting so close towards the end and you just want to get it finished then after I had assembled my skirt I did my sleeves because again I wanted some nice easy sewing um, and then after I completed my sleeves I did all my lining pieces to my bodice back panel pieces everything that I could stitch together I did um, before I got to that bit of my center front where I had to do bound buttonholes so that was literally the last thing that I could do before it came to stitching together um, anything else and that that's a really good way of breaking up your coat um, taking out a little bit of those overwhelming processes by breaking them down doing them into smaller chunks having bits of them all hung up around your sewing room that you're really happy with and you're thinking yeah I can see this I can see this it's all getting done and 
you're in the headspace to want to take on those bound buttonholes um, instead of starting with them first, looking at them going, I'm not really happy with that and filing away the project even before you start. If you leave them towards the end um, of the process of actually putting together all your coat, um, you'll be less daunted by them because you'll have so many other bits that you're really happy with. You'll just want to persevere and make as beautiful bound buttonhole as you possibly can. Um, if you get to that stage and you're still scared, you can cheat. You could make up your coat without any buttonholes um, and source someone locally with an industrial machine to do you three keyhole buttonholes that are stitched um, on the coat when the coat is completely finished. Um, you could source someone to do that. Make sure they are a reputable tailor because you don't want to hand over all your beautiful work to someone that gives you back really awful buttonholes. Um, do go to a professional and sort them. So that is another way of getting out of doing a bound buttonhole and still getting a really polished finish. You might want to do some nice press studs. You can get some really heavy press studs. Pop down through the front of your coat to hold that secure. Or you might want to go something really decorative like some little leather straps or something across the front so there are a few ways of getting around of not making um, your buttonholes for your actual princess coat but actually do give them a go because I used Gertie's method and it is honestly the easiest method of doing a bound buttonhole that I have ever ever done um, the way that I was taught at college they were just awful. It literally scares the heebie-jeebies out of me. But the method that um, Gertie recommended and I looked at her video before I did mine and definitely they're a win. And as long as you take your time, I think you'll be really, really happy with the result of your bound buttonholes. Before we get stuck in and actually start our sew along, I thought I would show you my princess coat um, without me in it. And here she is um, on my mannequin. So we've got our gorgeous rolled or shawl collar. We've got our lovely princess seams through the bodice to the waist and then all the way through the hem. We've got our gorgeous keyhole buttonholes there. And you can see the facing and the back of those buttonholes and obviously you've got the facing all the way down there as well you've got these absolutely gorgeous lantern sleeves in all their beautiful dramaticness and just as I turn around here you can see we've got the center back of our collar in line with the center back of our seam of our coat bodice and then that goes all the way through to the hem as well um, and you can also see how dramatic um, that skirt is as well and how that's got quite a lot of stiffness and shape to it so I'll just twist around again and here we have I will show you the main thing that I did completely different which you will notice in the sew along is that I have made my skirt and I've used a method called bagging out so it gets all assembled um, even through that lower seam because what we have here is actually a machine seam with the lining and with the fabric and then that all gets pressed and it gets attached to the waist so that skirt gets attached to that outer seam and then you just wrap your lining piece over the top there so that's the main assembly difference that I did to Gertie's um, construction and completely different to the book so you might be comfortable doing it that way you might want to do it the other way it doesn't really matter it's just the way that I particularly wanted to do it um, because I wanted my lining fully attached um, through the hem there and I just prefer to do that as a machine stitch and again that was just something that I've been taught through the tailoring process when I was at college and the other thing that I will mention that I haven't mentioned in further detail is that I did go with um, interfacing my whole coat now there are a couple of reasons that I did this one it helps to keep the structure of your fabric and if you've got a really loose woven fabric um, it's a really brilliant thing to do because it stops the fabric from distorting and coming out of shape. So that's something that you may want to consider. Um, where this particular one here is a much more tighter woven fabric, it's not necessarily needed, 
but however it does make the difference in knowing the right from the wrong side of your pattern pieces so inadvertently you don't end up with um, two right sides or two left sides of something when you're sewing it because you've already fused it and all your pattern pieces you know when you sew them together will be the right way because the wrong side of the fabric has the interfacing on it and also for the benefit of the sew along um, it did mean that you could see where I was stitching all my seams and you weren't guessing where that red stitched line was so there was a couple of advantages to that um, it's given me a couple of disadvantages as well because the fusing I will say hasn't taken a hundred percent like it has on previous projects that I have completely fused my overcoat in um, and that could be down to two reasons it could be a down to the person steaming it me um, that I haven't quite done it successfully my iron is slightly old and dodgy that could be another um, contributing factor and also I will be honest the best thing to do when you are steaming on interfacing on large pieces if you have or can get a hold of one of those really big shirt iron presses where you would have done it, I'm sure you've seen them around, where they're really big and they're kind of like a jumbo sandwich press where you pop your bit in, pop the lid down, it steams and you take it out. And by doing, by doing it with one of those, you would always get a much better better um, attachment of your interfacing to your pattern piece especially when you're doing larger pattern pieces so as I say there's a couple of bits that I'm not really happy with how the fusing has taken but hey we learn to live with that um, you know learn as we go that's what happens with sewing so here is my completed um, princess coat and now let's get sewing and get on with the tutorial here I've labelled up all my skirt pieces in their pairs so each piece of fabric has a label on it and then we've got our interfacing as we're interfacing our full circular skirt and here are our lining pieces done up in pairs so we've got our back skirt and also our front skirts. The first step is fusing the skirt panel pieces with the interfacing that we have cut and then once we have fused together all those pieces we then just need to stitch together the princess seam panels of our skirt fronts. So we're taking our centre front and our side front, we are matching up the notches and we're just going to pop in a few seam or few pins I should say down that seam just to line it up and also I have popped in a stay stitch around each panel piece of my skirt waist. Once I've machined down that princess line, I am then going to trim back those um, panel seams with my pinking shears. Now you will see throughout the whole sew along that I'm actually pinking just about every one of my seams and that is something that I personally like to do, but however you don't have to do it if you don't have any pinking shears. Then my next step is always to iron flat those seams that I have just machined. So what I tend to do is run my iron a little bit over the top of that seam first just to get it pressed to open and then I actually use a damp linen tea towel or sometimes it is very very damp and what I do is that I just lay that tea towel over my work um, mainly trying to keep it directly on my seam and I push the tea towel in the seam and just move my iron along um, as we go with the seam and that just helps to completely flatten out that seam and give you a really nice smooth polished look. Your next step is popping in your pocket in your side seam. Here you will notice I am using a completely different pocket to the pattern and I've gone completely rogue with it because I prefer a pocket that is joined at the waist and not one that hangs loose through the garment. So I have redesigned my pocket. If you don't want to redesign your pocket, and I will show you how to do it, um, you can insert insert Gertie's pattern piece here or stay tuned for the next bit and I will show you how I've created my new pocket piece. 
here is the actual pocket piece that does come with the pattern and what I'm going to do is actually trace around that pocket um, piece just with a bit of tracing paper marking in the grain line and also the pocket shaping around the pocket. Make sure that you do extend that line of that pocket side seam further up towards the waist and then take your new pattern piece and place it over your side front skirt pattern piece. Draw in the waistline marking because you've placed your pocket at the same position where it needs to be stitched in. You will come across 10 centimetres at that waistline point and then from that 10 centimetre mark you will just draw a line down to the curve of the pocket to get your new shaped pocket. Now I'm going to show you how I did my red facing piece for my pocket bag. I've come across seven centimeters from that side seam where the pocket will be inserted and I've just drawn a line at seven centimeters down the length of my pocket. I've popped in my grain line and then I've also traced around the lower hem edge of my pocket and also the waistline edge of my pocket and that is my finished facing piece. I'm sure you're looking at this and thinking that it is a lot of work for something that is not going to be seen as part of the inside of your pocket but as I did couture garment making at college in another lifetime it is something that has always stuck with me as just having some really nice polished finishes as a part of my sewing makes. Now I find that that long edge of my pocket red wool facing piece and what I've done is that I've cut a five centimeter strip of my lining fabric cut on the bias um, just slightly longer than the longest edge of that pocket facing piece. Then I have stitched it into position with a 15 mil seam allowance and then I have gone I've run another seam a foot's width away from my 15 mil seam so it's roughly probably a centimetre maybe seven mil depending upon the width of your machine foot and I've done that as a second row of stitching and then I've used that second row of stitching I've clipped it back and used that as a guide so I can wrap that facing piece or that bias strip around that raw edge of that um, red piece of facing we're putting over the pocket then I'm pinning in that facing piece into position on my pocket bag and then the next thing that I am going to do is that I'm going to stitch this facing into position down that um, strip that I am pinning through that middle bit of my pocket bag there. So that little seam that you can see where we've got all those pins, that is the line that I'm going to use and I'm going to use the method of stitching in the ditch to actually attach that facing piece in that position on my main pocket bag that will go into my skirt. And now you can see my completed pocket bags with that really nice bit of the red facing of them and then that just nice wrapped edge. Now that you've seen how I've made my brand new rogue pocket for my princess coat, here I am just stitching my pocket into position um, in that side seam of my princess coat. So once it's all stitched in, I am just clipping back that pocket bag and that pocket facing just to reduce some of the bulk in that particular area. Then the next thing that I'm going to do is actually an edge stitch where I stitch on the facing part of my fabric with the seam allowance underneath that particular part of the facing that I'm stitching. I literally a couple of mil in from the previous seam that you've stitched and this just actually helps to get that seam to roll underneath so you don't actually see on the outside of your garment. So this again is just another technique that we use through the sewing process um, just to hide some of our stitches and this gives a really nice polished finish to our coat.
Here you can see how that seam rolls underneath to give you that really nice sharp edge. Now I'm going to give my pocket bag a really nice steam down that seam. So I've got my damp tea towel and my iron. I'm just giving this a little bit of a flat steam first so it's nice and flat. And then I am turning the pocket bag onto itself and manipulating the roll so it sits the inside of that actual seam allowance of that side seam of my coat. So I'm just working my way down with my iron and making sure that that seam sits on the inside of my pocket and is not visible from the outside of my pocket seam. Here we have our completed pocket bag stitched in to our princess coat and you can see how nice that actually sits under that seam. And then the next thing that we need to do is to repeat the process for our remaining pockets at the side seams of our skirt part of our overcoat. Once you're finished all of your pockets and attach them to the back and the front of your side panel skirt pieces, what we're going to do is then stitch the side panel of our princess skirt. So here I have just laid my skirt front on top of my skirt back. I am marking down seven centimeters from my waist and popped in a little pen mark there. And I'm going to pin that together. And I have left a gap for 16 centimeters which is the gap that my hand will be able to go into inside to get inside my pocket. So I'm just pinning this into place just through that side seam there and you can just see my pin is just to the outside of that stitched seam where we attach the pocket and then what I'm going to do is start at the hem and work my way back to that 16 centimeter point that I made earlier and again I'm just placing my pin in that side seam stitching line. Now I'm just going to stitch the side seam of my skirt. So I've just placed my needle just in the inside of that closest red line you can see to you. I am doing a really good strong back tack stitch at the top and at the bottom of my pocket where I have left that 16 centimeter gap so my hand can actually get into my pocket when I'm wearing my overcoat and now I am just stitching all the way down to the hemline of my skirt just to finish off that side seam. Now I'm just going to pin close my pocket bag so I'm just going to pin it all around the edge and then I'm going to finish off that seam or that edge of my pocket bag with a 15 mil seam allowance when I do stitch it all completely closed. The other thing that I tend to do is maybe two or three rows of stitching around my pocket bag because I never ever ever want any holes to occur in my pocket bag um, and we all know how annoying a hole is in a pocket and I will take that back to the 16 centimeter point that we marked in that side seam. Then the last thing we need to do is our centre back seam. So we will take our two half skirts and join them together down the centre back seam. And then once that is done and you've given that seam a really nice press um, and press that seam open, you have completed your circular skirt for your princess coat. Begin with your sleeve prep for your lantern sleeve or whatever sleeve you are going to do. So do make sure that you mark in your center point notches at the top and at the bottom of your sleeve and also your back and front notches. So the back notch is always indicated with two and the front is one notch. Make sure you put your notches on both of your sleeves um, and the correct way round and also your lower lantern sleeve and you do only need to have your um, center notch for your lower lantern sleeve. Then you also mark your notches on your lining piece. Normally with this I just tend to do um, my little clip marks because I think it's easier and again I make sure I do it on my lower lantern sleeve as well before I start any sewing. So here we get a chance to do what I call a little bit of production sewing. So we prep all of our fabric pieces and our lining pieces. So we turn over our sleeves and we join the underarm sleeve of our 
upper lantern sleeve and our lower lantern sleeve in our main fabric and also our lining fabric and we pin all those into position we then take ourselves off to the sewing machine and zip through all of those seams really quickly and really efficiently um, doing them all in one go being your lining and your main fabric once I've finished machine stitching those underarm seams of my lining and my main coat fabric, I am just going to pink and shear all of those seams just to finish it off and to continue with that really nice smooth couture finish through my princess coat. Now let's give those underarm seams a really nice press so I'm just going to use my sleeve roll, run my iron across it to give it a little bit of flatness and then I'm going to give those underarm steam, seams a really nice steam to make sure that you've got that nice polished smooth flat seam under the arm. Now we're going to start our lower lantern sleeve assembly. So we've got those underarm seams pressed nice and flat and then we're going to take our lower main fabric lantern sleeve and insert it right sides together with our lining. Now I'm just going to match up those underarm seams and that centre notch seam and also pop in a few pins all the way around just to make sure that that lining is actually held into place nice and firm. We're now going to machine stitch that lower cuff edge of our lantern sleeve. Now this is a little bit fiddly to do, it is certainly not impossible to do on the machine but if you do take your time you can work your way all around your wrist area of your lower lantern sleeve and the other thing that I like to do is actually run two rows of machine stitching around that lower lantern sleeve just to make sure that my 15mm seam allowance is perfectly even all the way around my sleeve. And you can see now as we do turn through our lower lantern sleeve that you've got that really nice um, machine line edge for your wrist area on your lower lantern sleeve. Then the next thing we're going to do is nip in and clip out some of that bulk through that seam. So we're just doing some little V notches in there and that just helps to get that lower lantern sleeve to fold back on itself for that lining to sit nice and flat. Now we're going to edge stitch along this lower edge seam um, where the lining and the main fabric have been joined along the wrist. So what we need to do is our first bit of sewing origami and sliding that sleeve underneath the arm of the machine and making sure that you don't catch your actual fabric. So we're just going to run a machine stitch a couple of mil inside along that lining seam um, or along that lining piece just to help to get it to roll under um, your main fabric so your lining doesn't poke out and you can't see it. It's not the easiest but again it's not impossible to actually do as long as you take your time working your way along that seam. You can see here now where we've got that row of stitching just that couple of mil inside the edge um, of the cuff and how that seam does roll under and sits really nice um, as a finished look of our lower lantern sleeve cuff. And then the next thing we need to do is actually give that seam a bit of a press. So again I'm just using my sleeve roll and a damp cloth and I'm going to work my way all around that lower seam just to give it a really nice press and to make sure that that seam sits nice and flat underneath and it does roll over to the inside. And here I'm just trying on my lantern sleeve just to see how it looks. Now we're going to stitch our lower lantern sleeve to our upper lantern sleeve and what we're going to do is start off matching the seams at the underarm point, popping a pin through that seam junction and then we're going to pop our pin in that centre front um, or that centre line that we pencilled in earlier. Then we're going to evenly distribute our lantern sleeve around that curved hem line um, that gives us that really nice shape to our lantern sleeve so do take your time and just spread it out all nice and evenly and then once you have done that we will then machine um, this seam into place
Now we're just going to whip through on the machine and stitch that lower lantern sleeve and that upper lantern sleeve together at that seam join. So it just take your time and work your way around. This is a really nice little easy bit of stitching to do compared to some of our other sleeve assembly processes that we've already done. I've now clipped back that seam with my pinking shears and I'm going to use my hand roll on the side to give that seam a really nice steam to get it to sit really lovely and flat. So I've just got my damp cloth and with my iron I'm working my way around it um, and that gives us that really lovely shape to our lantern sleeve. The very last thing we need to do for our lantern sleeve is actually stitch our upper lining in place with our lower lantern sleeve. So we're just going to pin that into position and then we're going to take it off to the machine, we're going to stitch it and then again give it a press and a clip the same way that we did our main fabric lantern sleeve. We're going to start with our back bodice and we're going to put together our centre back bodice and our side back bodice panels. So make sure that you have all your notches marked and of course the key notches are those panel line princess seam notches. So we're just going to pin this together and I'm using a technique that I have been taught um, which is to run a gathering stitch down the less curved edge I'm going to say and you can see that I've got that gathering stitch down my centre back panel and that stitch just really helps to mould in that curve to the tighter curve of my side panel back bodice. Once I've machined those two pattern pieces together, I'm going to go in and clip that seam. So I'm going to do little clips um, or little cuts, I should say, about one centimetre apart either side of my panel seam. And I'm going to try and make sure that my clips are not directly opposite each other. So where I clip in, um, I'm going to try and clip in between the clips of each side just to make sure that I'm not weakening my bodice at any point. And then once I have done all my clips along my bodice, I'm going to press that seam open. And you can see here how the folds of the fabric split on one side and then the other side slightly curve underneath. And I'm going to use my trusty damp tea towel and give my bodice a really good steam along that curve on my pressing ham. And my ham also helps just with the curvature of that seam. You might think by using a damp tea towel um, to press those seams open that your work is going to get incredibly wet, but trust me, it won't. It does dry off very, very quickly. I'm now just going to pin together my centre back seam of my bodice. So I'm just popping a pin in the top and the bottom so I can evenly distribute that area of that seam. And then once I have pinned that, I will machine that. I will also clip it with my pinking shears and then give it a really good steam so it had so it sits nice and flat the next step is adding in our back stay piece and Gertie recommended just to use a muslin fabric for this and I've gone with a bit of cherry red navy spot that I had in my stash just because I wanted something a bit fun and I just thought I've got scrap and I will use that I'm now pinning in that back stay piece into position. So I've worked my pins all the way around and got it into position. And then when I stitch it, I like to do it in sections. So the first section that I'm going to stitch in is both my shoulder seams followed by my side seam. I will then stitch my neck seam and I will then do my armhole seams. By doing it actually in sections, I find that the muslin piece doesn't twist and it doesn't get any distortedness to it when you are machining so that's why I like to do it in sections and then you get again a nice polished finish with your stay. The next thing I'm going to do is my back lining to my bodice. So here I am having a look at my back bodice centre panel and what I'm doing is marking in that pleat that we have um, through the back of our bodice and the pleat is there to give movement and ease when we wear a garment. So you always want that lining piece to be bigger um, than your actual 
tote fabric and what I've done is that I've penciled in a that pleat line so I've got across six centimeters from my fold line and I've penciled in a length of seven centimeters into my bodice and I am doing exactly the same to the lower edge as I did to the top edge so here I am doing my six centimeter line and then I'm doing my seven centimeter line to know how far down I need to stitch and I'm pinning that into place then I will have machined that and then here you can see my finished pleat Gertie has recommended to fold her pleat to the one side I however like mine to be pressed open again it's just something that I like to do it doesn't matter which way you do particularly do the pleat um, but again this is just my personal choice. So I am matching up the centre line of that pleat with that stitching line and then I'm just pinning that into place and I will machine across the top and the bottom. Here's my pleat pressed all flat and here you can see how you get that really nice smooth finish um, on the inside of your coat with your pleat opening. My next step is popping on that back side bodice. So what I've done is I've run a gathering stitch down the side um, of that bodice panel and I'm going to use that gathering stitch that I'm going to pull up and help mould into my centre back panel. And by doing this method I just find it a little bit easier um, as I have a little bit more control on how I mould that particular line. So once I have pinned my panel piece into position I will then machine it, I will then cut it with my pinking shears and I will then give it a really nice steam to get a flat seam and I will press it open. Once more I'm going completely rogue to Gertie's instructions and what I'm now going to do is actually pop on my back neck facing onto my back bodice. So what I've done is I've run a gathering stitch through the back neck face, back neck facing piece. I will then marry up the center of my facing piece with the center of my back lining. I will then pin my facing to my lining using that gathering stitch to help mold in those two pieces um, together and then once I've got it all pinned into place I will just run it through, through the machine and stitch in my facing. Once I've machined in that facing piece I'm going to press it down flat into the main part of my bodice lining. I'm also going to edge that seam with my pinking shears and I'm going to take a few notches out of the actual lining just so the lining sits nice and flat within that lining piece. Continuing with our nice gentle bit of sewing of our princess bodice, we're now going to have a look at our front lining pieces. So we've got our front bodice lining and our side front bodice lining. So on our side piece, I have run a gathering line through that panel seam, that princess seam, and by having again that gathering line, it will help with the curve um, of moulding in that side front panel into the main front lining panel. Then once I have again pinned all that into place you just need to machine it with your 15 mil seam allowance. I will then also pinking shear my edge and also press that seam open. Um, again using my slightly damp tea towel because I do find that just makes it a little bit easier and also um, it does protect your lining um, from melting so by using that slightly damp tea towel. If you do forget to turn down your iron, it does work as a barrier between your iron and your fabric and you don't end up with any melted lining, um, which I'm sure we all have done some point in our sewing history. We're going to take a look at our front bodice under collar pattern in depth. So what we do have is our roll line for our collar followed by our dart and then we have a shoulder notch. We also have two side notches in our panel seam and our button markings. It's really important that you do actually transfer all those markings from your pattern piece to your actual 
fabric because it will make life so much easier as you go to assemble the front um, of your overcoat because you will know where all those markings need to be. And also the advantage of actually using the interfacing or fully interfacing your bodice overcoat um, is the fact that it makes those markings really easy to stand out especially using this really nice lightweight um, white woven interfacing. A really important point is to actually check the size of the buttons that you have purchased. Now Gertie has designed her buttonholes for a 28 millimeter button and the buttons that I've purchased are 32 mil so I do need to extend the length of those buttonholes. Gertie's bound buttonhole pattern piece is actually 6 by 16 centimetres and I decided that I wanted to use a slightly bigger piece of fabric um, that I could pin into place and not have to tack. So I've cut my piece at actually 16 by 20 centimetres which is effectively the same height as hers um, but the total width across of my panel piece and this just allows me to pin this particular piece into place and I didn't actually have to do any any tacking like she recommended with hers um, it's a little bit of a cheap method because you can just pin it into place and get on and start to do those buttonholes when I'm stitching around those bound buttonhole windows I am going to take my time and not rush because it is something that you want to get a really nice super polished finish on I'm also not back tacking um, at the beginning of my stitching either so I am just starting to machine stitch directly into my fabric along that long line of the window. When I get to my first corner of that rectangle I have left my needle in my actual fabric and I have just pivoted the fabric around and obviously lifted the foot to the machine. I've counted down six stitches on that first narrow end um, so I know that's the amount of stitches that I need at each one of my ends so my buttonholes are really really symmetrical and as good as I can possibly get them and then again when I come to my next corner again I'm leaving my needle within my fabric and just pivoting my fabric around with my foot up and then placing my foot back down. If you overshoot your end bits you can slightly fudge it a little bit but it is really important on those short stitches where I only count the six that I make sure I have six at each end. Then just take your time and repeat the process for your next two buttonholes just working your way around those little windows and counting your end stitches to make sure you do have that six um, stitches at each end so you get those perfectly symmetrical buttonholes. I'm now going to draw a pencil line roughly um, in the middle between each one of those windows and cut that piece of fabric um, into three pieces. The next thing that I do is actually draw a pencil line through the middle of that window so I'm doing this on the coat side of my fabric and I'm going to do a pencil line through each one of my little windows and also I'm going to do a little marking point at the end of each one of them roughly about five mil in from each one of the short sides of the rectangle I'm now going to take my tiny little sewing snip scissors and cut into that bound buttonhole. I'm cutting along that pencil line that I drew in the centre of that buttonhole rectangle and then I cut to the 5mm line that I had drawn and then diagonally into each one of the corners um, and I tend to start in the middle of my buttonhole and work out from the middle and then I do each layer separately so I've done my what is my main overcoat fabric first and then I cut through that bound buttonhole facing piece second. Do just take your time and be really careful not to overshoot anything because you don't want to cut into anything um, beyond that rectangle that you have stitched. So do just take your time to make sure that you get it right. Then once you're finished cutting into each one of those little buttonhole windows you just need to snip back the excess fabric. Then all we need to do is pull through all of those bound buttonhole patches through to the wrong side of our front bodice. 
Before I show you the next step on how to complete your bound buttonhole, I'm just making sure that my button does fit. I've given my bound buttonhole patches a really good steam so they are really nice and flat and you can see we've got some really nice sharp little rectangle windows and also you will notice that I have steamed or ironed those little seam allowances from our rectangle windows. Um, they're facing away from the centre of what will be our bound buttonhole. What I do here is now I manipulate that bound buttonhole piece of fabric. I bring it towards the centre of the little window. So it's just enough of that buttonhole fabric um, or that bound buttonhole fabric that you bring into the centre to get a nice flat um, opening for your bound buttonhole and literally I work my way across tacking and manipulating this bit of fabric till it meets really nice and even and flat in the middle. It does take a little bit of skill or it does take a little bit of time um, to get it to sit really nice and flat and even but as long as you take your time and manipulate it with it sitting flat, you should have a really nice even um, center opening for your buttonhole. Now I'm going to catch down this bound buttonhole patch of fabric um, around my little window that I've opened. And this is a really odd one to try and explain, but basically I've lined up the center opening of my buttonhole that I've just tacked closed temporarily. And with that sitting in the middle of my window, I'm then now going around um, the actual window itself where you can see that that seam is pushed out and I'm catching the buttonhole patch um, in and out of that window seam. So I'm working my way around, I'm making sure that opening for my button is directly in the centre of that window and I'm literally just going in and out, in and out from the under of that seam to the top where I'm catching all of that fabric to get a really nice smooth even finish to my bound buttonhole. One of the last steps we need to do to finish off our bound buttonhole is to actually run a machine stitch across the narrow end of those buttonholes. So here I have popped a pin in at each end and you will see that little triangle pointing out and that should line up with the centre of your bound buttonhole. So that should line up with the opening of your bound buttonhole. And then what I tend to do is a couple of rows of machine stitching um, just at the very end there I tend to pull back my buttonhole as far as I can and get that stitching line as close as I can to that particular line of my buttonhole and again I just do a couple of stitches at the other end and that just really helps to hold your buttonhole nice and taut and firm and then your buttonhole opening um, should be directly in the center and you should have some really nice finished buttonholes. And if you're all worried about the security of the lower edge of your bound buttonhole, here you can actually get in and run a line of machine stitching just directly. Um, I tend to do it just on the outside edge of my initial row of stitching for my window and that just helps to secure off those bound buttonholes just to make sure I've got a really nice smooth edge with them. Our next step is to stay stitch these little L areas of our front bodice under collar and also our collar facing piece and then once we've stay stitched those we do just need to clip into that little area of the L. Next up we're going to stitch in our neckline dart. So I'm just popping a pin in to bring those two arms together of that dart and I'm just going to smooth it down to the point with my fabric and pop a pin in the bottom there and just give it a little bit of a press with my hand before I give it a quick once over with the iron. When I'm stitching my dart into position I'm not going to start at the very top. I am starting from that stay stitching line that we did earlier and I'm using my pencil line um, guide for my dart um, that hopefully you have penciled in onto where to stitch through with my dart to get it really nice and symmetrical. I've gone all the way to the end of my dart and I am tying off the end um, in a couple of knots instead of back tacking it and by doing this method you will see how incredibly smooth the base of that dart is.
don't forget your shoulder reinforcement interfacing piece that you do need to iron on to your front bodice. I'm now going to stitch together my front bodices along that princess seam. So I have done a stay stitch all the way down um, 15mm in, so I've done it at the same point as my seam line. I'm then doing some little clips in there to help curve that seam out. And I'm just pinning the bodice side front um, starting at the bottom and working my way up and by having all those little clips it allows you to manipulate um, one curve around the other curve and this is a really great technique um, if you are a slightly larger busted girl and you do find that that side panel has a really deep curve to it this does allow you just to manipulate it all in together really nicely before you stitch it. You can see here how we've got that stay stitching line just the inside of our main seam allowance line that we've stitched and you can see how lovely that curved panel line looks from the outside. I'm just going to take away some of that bulk from that side um, front panel seam. So I'm just doing some V-shaped notches all the way around that seam and then I am doing my best to not actually notch opposite my other notches in my panel piece. So I am trying to keep them um, not lined up. I, I don't know how else to try and explain it. So you don't want them directly opposite each other, you kind of want them um, in the fabric gaps opposite each other if you get what I mean. And then once I have made it to the end of that seam that I've notched, I've then got my trusty little ham that I'm placing underneath my bodice and that helps with the curve because obviously it's curved and it's not flat. And I'm just going to work my way along that curve with my damp tea towel to create some steam and to get that seam to sit really nice and flat. And also if you do need to remove some more air Area from those um, V notches do so along here so you do get that nice flat smooth seam and again you will find that the steam will help it to get to sit really nice and flat. I'm now going to do the centre back seam of what is actually my rolled shawl collar. So I'm pinning together my two fronts which is my bodice front under collar pattern piece together and then I'm pinning together my collar facing piece together and then once they're pinned I will machine both of them down with a 15mm seam. I will trim them off with my pinking shears and give them a really good steam. We just need to now to press on our collar stand interfacing piece and you can see where we've got that roll line we just need to line up this interfacing piece along that roll line and then we just press that into place. Once again I have gone rogue through the assembly process and what I am doing is attaching my facing collar to my main collar and what I've done is that I've joined the two collars at the centre back seam and then I'm pinning from the centre back seam out to the waist edge making sure that everything is lined up and correctly distributed and then I'm doing it from the waist edge to that centre back seam in exactly the same way again making sure that my collar is co is correctly distributed um, before I do take it off to the sewing machine and stitch it into place. Now that we've stitched our outer edge of our collars together, what we need to do is understitch the actual collar. So we're going to understitch along the facing edge there. Then we're going to flip our fabric over and understitch on the right side of the collar. And then as we come around to the other side, we're going to flip our collar back over and we're going to understitch once again on the facing piece. Now I know this sounds really complicated, but trust me, it's not. We're going to start at the waist of our bodice and what we're going to stitch through is the facing and the two seam allowances. So that's actually the facing seam allowance and our main fabric seam allowance. So you've got those three layers directly under your needle and by actually pulling your facing really nice and tight you do get a really nice smooth edge with that understitch line and we take that understitch line which is usually one or two millimeters in from that um, original seam line back to what is considered the break line of a collar. So that is the point in the pattern where you can see that the collar does jut out. Now I'm just doing a back stitch um, and pulling off my thread and then what I'm going to do is get my little trusty scissors and I'm going to cut into that particular notch where you can see um, 
where that fabric comes to it where that collar comes to a point so you can see that point and if you're a little bit scared to get too close into that collar with your scissors um, you can do like I do and just unpick a little bit um, to get back into there and take your unpick and to go back as close as you can to that stitching line and then you just need to again clip into the other side um, with your scissors back to the same point be really careful that you don't clip through that stitching line because you do just want to clip literally back to the stitching line and then this allows you to actually flip your um, seam allowance of that collar to the other side if you don't have a super pair of sharp scissors you can do what i do and slightly dig away at your seam with your unpick and then the other side, I'm actually going to pop my unpick in um, the seam allowance and tear it back to the edge of the fabric. So I'm actually cutting away from my um, machine line and I'm not worried about creating a hole or splitting my fabric with this particular method. Now we're going to understitch our actual collar edge. So what we actually want is our seam allowance to sit under um, again the seam that we're going to stitch but we're going to stitch on the right side of our fabric and I know this sounds really weird um, but trust me it is correct so you're not stitching on your facing piece of your collar you're stitching on your front bodice under collar piece of fabric so what you will have under that um, seam that you stitch it you will have your seam allowance of your two um, collar pieces and also your stitching on top of your main bit of fabric and what I do to make sure I get a really nice even under stitch is that I pull my fabric really really tight as I work my way around I do take my time don't rush it um, because you do want to make sure it is a really nice and smooth under stitch and what you do is literally you just pull your fabric and stitch in that two millimeters in from that original stitched seam and the under stitch actually helps to curve and manipulate that lower edge um, seam allowance I guess so that seam actually sits under the garment and it is not visible so again it sounds a little bit tricky but it is super easy to master and a good under stitch is something that you will use in so many many of your actual garments but it's just that this particular one is a little bit odd because you are doing it on what is considered to be the right side of your collar fabric see how easy it is for me just to continue down on that center front seam doing my under stitching as we've already got that notch underneath which allows me to flick out um, those seam allowances to the other side underneath the front facing and also I do take uh, my needle in and out of my fabric to restart um, just to get that nice smooth line all the way down the edge and you can see here how we've got that um, edge stitched line or under stitching line this side on the actual facing piece and then further up you will notice that that edge stitch line is actually on the main fabric piece we now need to trim back those outer collar edge seams so I've taken my pinking shears and I have pinked the outer edge which is my main collar fabric and then I've taken my normal scissors and I'm trimming back as close as I can back to my seam allowance and that just helps to grade and reduce the bulk in that particular area so again you can see when that seam rolls over you've got a nice crisp finish um, and it's doesn't have too much bulk but the wider seam is actually under the main part of the fabric then you're going to do exactly the same um, to the outer collar edge so what we're going to do is pinking shear the facing edge and trim back with our scissors our actual collar edge of our main fabric 
You can see now that I've given my outer edge of my collar a really good steam with the iron and popped in some clips to help with the roll. You'll notice how we've got that understitching line on the facing side and then we've got that understitching line on the right side of the fabric as we go around the outer edge of the collar so when the collar is turned over there is no visible stitching and again you will have that um, roll line of your collar on the underside and then when we come to the centre front that stitching is on the facing side. The next step is to actually mark in the back of those windows for our bound buttonholes. To mark in the little windows what I'm going to do is pop a pin in each one of the corners and that will make it really easy for me when I flip it over to see where my actual buttonholes are in the facing. I've got my grading ruler here and what I'm going to do is a pencil line as close as I possibly can um, to all those pins. So I'm using a chalk pencil so that will actually brush off um, and I'm literally just going in between all the pins to make sure I've got um, a really visible line and then I'm going to do exactly the same to the other side um, to create those windows so I know where those windows are in my facing and then once I think I've got all those um, pins in position or those pencil lines I should say in position I'm going to take out my pins and then I'm going to draw in um, that final line I'm now going to mark in a more solid line um, with my grading ruler and my nice little chalk pencil so I know that all my backs of the windows to my buttonholes are all exactly the same size and they're all the same space apart so it does take a little bit of time just to double check this but again it's a really important detail to check. Like Gertie I'm going to use the organza window method to finish off the back of the buttonholes and this was the first time that I'd actually used this method and I found it incredibly easy to do and I will definitely be doing it again so yeah there's a win for how she has recommended to do her buttonholes and I just found a bit of organza that I had knocking around in my stash I don't know if it's silk or if it is polyester and I don't think it really matters I think it's more about the um weave of the fabric to get those buttonholes to stick those buttonhole windows to have a really nice shape to them and then once I have obviously pinned in my bit of organza I've just gone over to the machine and I'm going to stitch in the organza and I'm going around those little windows that we had drawn again I'm starting on the long side and once I get to my first little corner point um, I'm leaving my needle in the machine pivoting my fabric and then just moving it all around to turn it around to do that short edge and again I'm counting my stitches to make sure that my stitches are an even length at each end and again you will notice here that it becomes a little bit more difficult to maneuver your fabric and that's the reason as well why I chose to do my um, collar facing slightly earlier on in the process of finishing off my coat so it just meant that I was maneuvering around a little bit less fabric because when you're doing the full length overcoat you've got quite a lot of fabric that you do need to maneuver around and I just found it easier to do it here and again when you come to the other short end count down to make sure you've got the same number of stitches and then you will do your second long edge and again I haven't back tacked at the top um, or at the start or at the end when I've done my long edges so here we are just fast forwarding through the next two buttonholes got to love the fast forward motion in a video don't you if only I could sew this quickly and so accurately so what I've done is that I've started originally with my middle buttonhole and then I've gone to my bottom bottom buttonhole to make sure that my organza is nice and tight and then I've done my top one as my last one again you might like to work from top to bottom but I just wanted to work from the middle out um, again Again, it's just something that I like to do but it doesn't matter what order you actually do your buttonholes in. Once I've clipped back 
all of the loose threads on the back of my window. So what I'm then going to do is cut open those actual backs of those windows to my buttonholes. So I'm going to use my unpick and just literally poke a little hole in the back of that facing, just enough to get my scissors in. And then I'm going to pop my scissors through and I'm going to cut up the middle line of this facing. I'm not going to cut it completely to the end. I am going to stop short roughly again about five mil like we did with the original buttonholes and then I'm going to cut diagonally into the corner to create those little triangles at each end. When I'm cutting into my buttonholes I tend to work um, one side first and then I turn my fabric and I do the other side so it just makes it a little bit easier for me um, working from the middle out so I just extend my line that I've got through the middle there that I've cut and then I'm just clipping really quite carefully into each one of those corners to make sure that I've got those nice little triangles so I can turn through the organza. Once I've finished snipping into the back of my buttonholes I'm just going to cut my organza into three pieces and then I will be able to pull my organza through um, the little windows that I've again once created um, and this allows me to finish off the back of my bound buttonholes. I've given the backs of those windows a really good press so you can see we've got some nice sharp rectangles and I've popped in some pins um, just to hold that organza in place. I've now just popped back in my clips to hold my roll line into position and what I'm going to do is actually run a stitching line just down that lower edge of that seam um, or that facing I should say where those organza pieces are just to hold them in position and then once I've done that seam line literally just a foot's width from the raw edge I'm going to clip back um, all that organza and just get rid of a little bit of that um, excess fabric there. We're going to stitch in now our front linings along that facing seam of our bodice. So we're just going to grab those lining pieces that we'd stitched together earlier pin them all into position and again you will need to do a little bit of molding around the curved line. Um, you shouldn't need too much of a gathered stitch if any whatsoever and it should just pin into place and then be really nice and easy to sew. Um, you might find it slightly easier to run a gathering stitch along there um, but again you can do that or not do that it doesn't really matter it should just mold in nicely into position and then once you've stitched that seam in you're going to again do an understitch um, slightly further away from that seam you've just stitched pulling your lining piece nice and taut and then you're just going to run that little line just that couple of mil away from that seam just to hold that lining into position so it's really nice and smooth and again once you've done that clip back your seams with your pinking shears if you're pinking them Next we're going to pop in our back bodice, so we just need our back bodice that we've already assembled, we're going to attach that down the side seam um, and once we've pinned it into position we're just going to machine it, give that seam a really good steam and then clip it with your pinking shears if you're doing pinking shear edges like I have and then you're going to repeat exactly the same process um, for your lining along that seam as well. Now we're going to do the neck edge and shoulder seams of our bodice. So I've started with my main fabric and I've just started at the one side and what I'm doing is that I'm pinning across that seam. So I've done the shoulder seams on one side. I've left my dart free. Um, hopefully you can see that where I haven't placed a pin there. I've put a pin in my centre back seam um, through my neck edge and my collar so I know that is all bang on and then I'm just distributing the rest of that collar area out um, evenly around that neck area and then I'm doing exactly the same to the other side so I'm going to start from the shoulder seam and work in so I'm just aligning my shoulder seams taking it back to that dart I'm leaving that dart free so I'm not pinning that into position either side and then I'm just manipulating my fabric around that neckline to get that 
back shoulder, that back of my bodice into position with the back of my collar. And I'm just taking my time to make sure everything's all lined up. And then we actually stitch this seam in three sections. So we leave the dart free and we just stitch across each one of the lines. So here I am at the machine stitching across um, my shoulder seam. So you will see that I have back tacked it and I'm stitching across my shoulder seam. When I get to that dart, you will see that I will back tack before the dart. I will take my needle out of my work. I will just lift my foot and obviously maneuver my foot and my needle before I pop my needle back in and then stitch that second bit of our back edge. So that's effectively the collar edge that we're now stitching. And again, I'm just zipping through that until I come to the dart once more where I will back tack at that end. Again, I will take my needle out of my work, lift my foot, pop my needle back in the other side of that dart, back tack and continue on to the end of my shoulder. And then that is our shoulder seams and our neck edge of our overcoat stitched so the collar is now all attached and you will just see where you've got that tiny little hole um, but it is all secure and your collar is now all in place along that shoulder and neck edge. I'm going to mark in the actual junction point of my neck and shoulder line on the back facing. This just makes it really easy um, to help position the back of my facing through that back neck edge of my rolled collar. So once I've got those junction points, I'm just pinning in the back neck facing. So I line up the center back. Um, I've got my little um, junction points that I've marked on that facing. So they're being pinned through those notches that we did at the very, very beginning. Um, so I've just got those notch markings at each end and evenly distributed out that back neck edge of the facing and the collar and then once I've done that I just machine across that back neck edge um, and back tack at the front and the beginning and then we've stitched our back neck. I'm now just doing my shoulder seam so I'm lining up um, the interfacing point where I've got my red main part of my fabric and I'm working from that shoulder line back to the neckline and then out to the shoulder edge and I'm just making sure that my fabric is all smooth and all fits into position. Once I have pinned that into position I'll then machine it and press it open and give it a bit of a pink with my pinking shears. Here you will notice there is a little bit of excess fabric that is created within the back part of the coat at that shoulder seam and you do just need to clip that away really gently. You will see that you've got that little bit of excess um, in the same position on your main fabric and also your lining fabric at the back of the collar. Be really careful to not clip too deep because I did clip into the corner. Um, I will be honest and then I had to stitch it in together but you don't see it because it is actually um, underneath um, the part of the collar so you are quite lucky with that if you do have a little bit of an accident with it. And then the next thing that we do is that we actually um, bring together that neckline or back neckline edge. So I'm placing a pin through the middle um, of my back neckline through the main fabric and my lining fabric. I'm starting from the center back and working across. So I'm putting a pin right through that stitching line of both layers. And I've got my seam, as you would have seen, pressed open so I can get that pin all the way through and get a really nice smooth edge across the back neckline of my collar. And what I'm going to do is actually secure my lining and my main fabric across that back neck edge. So once I've got all my pins effectively in through that seam, I'm going to stitch in the ditch by hand because I want to secure that neck edge. So my roll line of my collar is secure and my collar won't move from my main fabric to my lining. I will be honest, this is a faff. Um, 
I have tried it on the machine and I didn't get the result that I was really happy with so I decided to go through with some really big secure tacking stitches or not so big to be honest um, tacking stitches in the ditch to get those two pieces nice and secure and then once you have come to the end of that you have done the most major part of your princess coat so well done to you if you've made it this far without a nervous breakdown and then the last thing that we need to do um, to finalize the bodice of our princess coat is pop in our sleeves. Here we have our basically finished princess coat bodice and now I'm going to show you how to pop in your sleeve to your bodice. So do just make sure that you've got your notches marked on your sleeve so that is one notch to go in the front and two notches to go in the back and we're just going to pop that into the sleeve armhole of your princess coat. Here I have two bias strips of fabric, so that's two strips of fabric cut on the cross grain, so it's got a stretch to it. I'm now going to pop in a notch in the centre of each one of these strips, and these strips are five centimetres wide by about 30 centimetres long. And these little strips of fabric are going to actually help me mould in the head of my sleeve into the armhole of my bodice. So what I'm going to do now is pin this strip to the center point of my sleeve and then I'm going to use the stretch of these little strips to help mold in my sleeve when I take it over to the machine. Here I'm stitching that bias strip into the sleeve head of my sleeve and this works as helping as I said to help mold the sleeve actually into the bodice. So what I'm doing is that I'm pulling this strip as I stitch it into position and it kind of works as a gathering stitch. So it helps to bring that really nice shape to the top of your sleeve head. And then we do exactly the same thing to the other side of our sleeve head, except this time we are stitching it the other way around. So it's not as easy to stitch um, as you do find the first one because you're not sitting at the machine in your natural position so this one is always a little bit trickier as you do try and pull and mold in that strip of fabric around the top of your sleeve head. Here you can see that really nice molded shape to the top of our sleeve from that bias strip. Now we're going to pin in our sleeve into our armhole. So again, just make sure that you check where your notches are and marry them up. So obviously you want to make sure that you've got your right sleeve in the right side of your coat. So by doing that, you will be able to match up those back notches and that front notch and also at the underarm point as well and the top of the sleeve head. And then what you do is just pin in all your pins around your armhole and then you will be ready to stitch it into position. Once your sleeve is all pinned into position you just need to nip over to the sewing machine and just work around that armhole sleeve um, at your 15mm seam allowance point stitching in your sleeve to your armhole and you will find with that particular strip that we added in earlier how easy this is to actually do. And here we have our sleeve inserted into our bodice. We've got a really nice smooth finish and I have to be honest, the bias strip method of sleeve insertion is one of the easiest I have ever used. We are now at the trickiest bit of sewing um, that you will do through the whole production process of your princess coat. So what we need to do is join the lining of your bodice and your sleeve together and the first thing that I'm going to do is pop a pin in at that underarm seam. Pop a pin in the shoulder seam of your lining matching up the center of your sleeve at that point and then also go in and make sure that you've got your sleeve notches and your bodice notches correctly matched. So at the underarm point you want to make sure you've got your front notches on your sleeve and your bodice matched and your back notches also matched correctly. I tend to use a little bit of a cheap method when I am gathering in my sleeve head lining into my bodice armhole lining and what I have done is I've run a gathering stitch um, through the top of that sleeve head and that does help me just to ease in all that area of my sleeve head into my lining and it does help to just proportionately distribute 
all that area of that sleeve head through the armhole. And I do exactly the same thing on the other side, making sure that my underarm notches of the back or the front, depending upon which way you've done it, are correctly matched. And again, I just pull in that gathered um, thread to help evenly distribute that area through the top of my sleeve. As you stitch your sleeve into your lining bodice armhole, you will find that this is quite tricky because you've got lots of fabric that tends to twist around on itself and it's not the easiest um, actual step to master in many sewing processes. But as long as you leave your machine needle firmly wedged, I will say, in your fabric seam, should you need to lift your foot um, and to help untwist your fabric to make it to the end, you shouldn't have any issues of actually using this particular method in inserting your sleeve into your bodice lining. Now, as I untwist my sleeve in my coat or my sleeve lining to my coat, you will see that we've got that really nice machined edge line all through that part of my lining of my coat. Now we just need to finish off the inside of that armhole sleeve of both the lining and of our main coat fabric. So I have just pinking sheared around the edge of my lining and I've also pinking sheared the main part of my coat as well. Here you will also notice that I've trimmed back my sleeve back to nearly zero and I have left the full bias strips untouched which just help with the roll line of the sleeve. Here we have some really nice um, prim shoulder pads that we're going to pop in our overcoat um, and these particular prim shoulder pads are really nice because they're not very thick and they will just help with the structure and the draping of the shoulder line of your coat. These particular shoulder pads do have a front and a back and I've indicated the front and the back obviously with the F and the B. So you can see here that the front has got a nice point to it and the back has got a slightly more rounded shape to it so you do need to make sure that you do pop in your shoulder pads the correct way. I'm also popping in a pencil line down the front down the middle of my shoulder pad just to make sure I know where to line that up at the shoulder seam. I'm then tacking in that shoulder pad into that seam allowance with a few tacking stitches before I start to work down that center seam um, tacking in my shoulder pad. So I'm working either the side of my shoulder line seam, catching a couple of stitches in that seam allowance and then catching it into the shoulder pad until I work all the way down through that seam and have completed that particular part of my seam and then I'm just popping in a couple of tacking stitches at the very end as well to make sure that the shoulder pad is fully secure. Now you do want to make sure you've got a little bit of movement within your shoulder pad and you can see there that the stitches are quite large and then the next thing that we do is tack in the ends of our shoulder pads at the front and the back there where we've got the F and the B. So again we want to make sure we've got movement and our shoulder pad is not firm so it does need to have a little bit of movement there just to move with the coat and the body. Then once we have finished tacking in both ends of those shoulders you will notice I'll do a couple of stitches through that roll line to make sure that that roll line sits in position nicely with the sleeve as well and then once all that is done you can see here how you've got that nice smooth line of your shoulder. Now I'm going to share with you a really unconventional method on how I actually hem a circular skirt um, when I don't have anyone to help me. So what, I, what I'm working with is my 50 centimetre um, grading ruler and what I've done is that I've measured down 50 centimetres and I've popped in a pencil line to indicate my 50 centimetres and what I do is that I try and use my ruler on the narrow side with it standing up because I do find that using a ruler this way you do get a more accurate marking as opposed to having it actually flat on the fabric like it is here. So once I've penciled in 
all those um, 50 centimeter marks um, and made sure that they're all correct um, and done a little bit of a scribble line. I then transfer the second half of my length because my ruler is not long enough to do it all in one go to my hemline um, just to make sure I get that nice even um, circumference to my hem um, because obviously a circle skirt does drop and we need to take out that excess um, area in the hem along the seams where it will have dropped. Now I will be honest I do use this method quite a lot when it comes to doing a circular skirt in something like a quilting cotton um, or a poplin. It's probably not the best thing to do on something really sheer and slippy but again this method does work really well with the skirt lining as well. So do your skirt lining in exactly the same way that I've done it here and then what you need to do is just chop off your excess where your skirt has dropped and as I said you will notice that it will drop slightly more on the princess seam which is cut on the bias as opposed to your center front or your side seam which is cut on the straight grain. For the hem allowance um, of my overcoat I'm going to actually have a six centimeter hem. Um, because this is an overcoat I do want something really weighty and six centimeters always works for me as an overcoat hem. So what I've done is that I've drawn in on the front facing piece my six centimeter line where my hem will be or my finished hem will be on my coat and now I'm just adding in a 15 mil seam allowance on that particular line and I'm going to trim back both my front facings um, to that 15 mil line. Now I've got my facing piece here and I'm marrying that up with the centre front of my princess coat circular skirt. So I'm just pulling in my facing so it's nice and taut all the way down and it's even. And you can see here I'm just popping in the pin across if what is going to be um, my finished hem of my princess coat. Now I'm going to stitch across the bottom of my facing piece that I've marked in at the 6 centimeter marking point on the hem and also down the side there just a couple of inches because I want to make sure that that facing piece is held into position. The next thing I'm going to do is actually pin in my lining or pin my lining to my main fabric. So I'm going to marry up the lining seams all through the fabric seams and pop a pin in through each one of the junctions and then go back in and pop a few pins in before I actually stitch along that seam with a 15 mil seam allowance. Then my next thing to do now that I've got all the way across to the other front and clearly I haven't chopped back my facing like I said we should, um, I'm just going to mark in the same 6 mil line and I am taking it from the actual wool fabric at the front because I know that measurement is then the same on both of my facing pieces and I should have a dead even front. So I'm just drawing in that six centimeter hemline that is going to be stitched and I can feel the change in my fabric where my lining starts so I know how far to stitch across that seam when I bag it all out in that particular corner. I'm also going to pop in just a 15 mil seam down the center front there so again I've got a little bit of a gauge to know how far to stitch down when I'm attaching that lining piece to the center front because I do want that that really secure as I go through and actually stitch that lower edge seam. Now that our facing corner has all been stitched in and you can see that L shape there and also you will notice that I have machine stitched that lower hem edge of my overcoat we are just going to trim out all the excess fabric through that corner of the facing and the main piece of the actual overcoat front fabric. So do remember to leave in a seam allowance um, in your main fabric so you're not quite cutting back all the way um, out of the facing piece across there. You're leaving in that 15 mil and you can see here that that corner is just a little bit short and also you will notice that we do have a little bit of unstitched area between that hem, final hem length and the 
where we've got our bagged out corner and again if you do need to remove some more fabric take it out here we've got that really nice sharp bagged out corner and a really lovely roll line for our hem as we now take a look at the finished hem you can see that we've got a nice depth of our fabric which is four and a half centimeters and then we've got that nice machine line of the actual lining attached to that hem facing of our overcoat and you can see where the panel lines join up and that really nice sharp corner where we've bagged it all out as well with that front facing and again you can see where it's all clipped and the lining is stitched all the way to the hemline and you've got that little bit of that loose corner that we didn't stitch down with the lining and that just folds back onto itself to help create that really lovely smooth flow through of the lining and the actual um, hem edge of our overcoat so you do have that tiny little bit of an opened gap there which is perfectly fine but you've got a really nice machined edge that's exposed with your lining and then we've got along there where we have attached that hem line on the actual interfacing of the overcoat um, and then that is then the actual hem is all stitched into position catching that interfacing so you don't catch any of the main fabric and every couple of inches I do tend to do a tacking stitch just to make sure that the hem is secure and if for any reason it does unravel it only takes a couple of inches and not your whole hem I'm now just going to pin that front facing um, into place along the front of my skirt. So we've just got those two edges, which is the last bit of our skirt to assemble. And I'm working from the hemline back to the waist and pinning it back to the waist and making sure that it is all even and super tight. And then I will do exactly the same to the other side of my front opening. Now that we have attached our skirt lining and facing to our main fabric along that centre front point, you can see here where we've got that nice roll line down that centre front there that just helps that facing seam to sit underneath, um, to sit under the actual centre front seam. I've also clipped down the centre front of that seam with my pinking shears to give it a really nice finish and here you can see how that roll line just sits under that actual seam so it's not exposed on the outside. Then the next thing that I'm doing is that I'm actually pinning my lining um, to the waistline point and I'm going to this then completes the whole bagging out process of the skirt overcoat so it is all completely done um, and it's all finished in. Here, you will notice that I'm actually pulling up the lining a 15mm seam allowance and that is because I did forget to remove a little bit of excess out of my skirt lining which you should always do so your skirt lining never hangs below your hem and to be honest I do prefer doing this from the waist when I'm doing this particular method because I do find I get a slightly neater finish across the hem um, and that's just something that I personally like. Um, so I've just pinned this up 15 mil all the way through and at that very centre front seam I've taken it back to zero where you can see and then once I have stitched this into place um, and run, a, run a, my machine line all through there and completely bagged out that hem I will then clip back all that excess and my skirt will be ready to attach to my completed bodice through the waistline seam. Now we're starting to pin our bodice to our skirt and um, we're going through quite a number of thicknesses here so it is really handy if you've got quite if you've got a nice set of really sharp pins to get through those seams because they are quite thick with your wool and your lining and also the fact that I have interfaced the skirt and all of my bodice. Now do take care in getting through lining up those seams between the actual um, bodice of the 
coat and also of the skirt of your coat. It does take a little bit of time to get through all those seams. And also you will notice at different points I'm giving my bodice a bit of a tug to get it to fit into my skirt waist and that is because the waist of my um, bodice on my coat is a 14 and the skirt waist is a 16. And as we come to the end of marrying up all of our panels you will notice on the skirt um, it does have the roll line on the lining and you do just want to make sure that your bodice does finish just at the inside because that corner is quite thick and you don't want it to go too far in. Now that we've stitched our waistline together of our bodice and our skirt, we're just going to check over all those seams and make sure that they match beautifully. If there's any that you're not happy with, now is your opportunity to actually unpick them and redo them. Then once that's done, we're going to trim back the skirt waist and pinking shear the edge of our bodice. Now we need to get in and reduce some of that bulk at that centre front seam where the bodice and the skirt meet up. So we just get a little pair of scissors and we're just snipping in diagonally to get rid of some of that bulk. And then what we're going to do is wrap that facing piece around on top of itself. So you will see here where we've got two facing pieces right side together and we're going to pop a pin in it there and what we're actually doing is bagging out the the front half of the lining of our bodice so what we're doing is we're taking the lining seam back to the side seam and we're pinning it all into place along the waistline and we're going to match up those panel seams so again we get that really nice flow through um, from the bodice lining into the skirt lining and you can see here what I mean by how we've wrapped it all around and then once all those pins are into place we're going to machine stitch from that facing piece that red facing piece back to the side seam now you can see the bodice lining is stitched to the waist. You can see here where we left that opening when we were bagging out our front lining and what I'm doing now is we're going to get in and take away some more of that bulk in that um, centre waist seam but don't do what I did and grab the first pair of scissors um, like I did I grabbed my fabric scissors you might want to go something for slightly more size appropriate as we take away some of that um, extra bulk within that waistline seam and then I'm just going to tuck it all under and I'm going to give it a really good steam um, to make sure that that seam sits really really flat um, and you will notice that nice clean line that we've got down the front there where that facing follows all the way through and you can notice the first part of that bagging out of that waistline um, lining piece. So once we've given that a really good steam we're going to move on and finish all of our beautiful buttonhole um, little windows at the back of our coat. For finishing off the little windows um, for our bound buttonholes in our facing piece, what we need is a length of thread and I'm going to go into the middle of my overcoat through that back seam that we haven't stitched down with the lining just yet and I'm going to do a couple of tacking stitches um, at the back of those bound buttonholes just to secure my thread before I pull it through to the front of my overcoat and then start attaching those little windows I guess to my bound buttonholes. So the stitch that I'm using is something like an in out in out stitch. So I'm going into the bound buttonhole, coming up out of the bound buttonhole and then going into the little window. So it's almost like two stitches. So hopefully you can see it. It's not the easiest to explain, but um, I'm sure you can see how I'm going, how I'm working my way around attaching that facing to my bound buttonhole. Now I am pulling it really tight and I'm doing really small stitches because I do find this it's going it is quite a high use area so you do want it to be really really secure and it might not be the easiest thing to do because you're going through lots and lots of layers but if you do take your time and use quite a lot of stitches and very small stitches you should find that your facing is incredibly secure and you will get that really nice neat finish on the inside of your bound buttonhole.
I've slip stitched my front facing to my skirt front facing. You can notice a tiny bit of a step there at the center front where there is all that bulk, but it's not too bad. And there we have our bound buttonholes and our finished windows at the back. You can just notice as well where we've bagged out that front seam of the front half of our overcoat. And the next thing we need to do is turn under our seam allowance of our back lining and attach that at the waist. You may have noticed a row of stitching there which I've got along the bodice lining there and that is just my little cheat guide of knowing where exactly my seam allowance is and how much I need to turn up when I'm stitching in that particular seam. So once I've got all my panels lined up I nip over and do exactly the same thing to the other side of my back bodice popping in the pins as I go so I know exactly where to stitch along that seam and I will slip stitch that into place. So we just need to slip stitch that seam done and the stitch that I'm going to use is actually a herringbone stitch. Um, it is referred to in the little princess um, coat booklet as a catch stitch but I was always taught um, to refer to this particular stitch as a herringbone stitch. Don't ask me why, I guess that's the thing of, you know, different different sewing terms across the globe. Um, so exactly the same stitch where I'm catching the top and then the bottom into, I guess, the main part of the seam. And I'm just doing a little catch stitch every so often, just so nothing unravels and that back seam is really secure. The lining waistline seam now is really nice and secure with that tiny little herringbone stitch that you can hardly see. So the last thing we need to do is attach our buttons to our princess coat. And if you're like me and you have got shankless buttons, um, when you're stitching them on, you do need to create a shank for your button, which allows for the movement of the button um, to go through those buttonholes. So we're making a shank on the bottom of our button. And just to show you how I mark up my buttonhole placement on my coat, I've got my pattern piece and you should notice that you've got all your buttonholes marked out and I've also marked in my seam line actually on my coat as well. So I've just flipped it over and I'm going to marry up that centre or that front seam and that waistline seam to make sure I get everything into position and that I am stitching my buttons in the right position for my actual buttonholes. And I'm going to pop a little pin through the middle there of the first one and then I'm going to do exactly the same to the second one and you will see that you've got um, you know on the pattern piece you've got that center point of that button marked so that is the point that I do actually want to stitch um, or I want to start to stitch in my button so it's all uniformed on both um, on all of my buttons I've got myself a length of thread that is roughly two meters in length I've started with and what I've done is that I folded it over so it comes back to a meter in length and then I've threaded it through my needle so what I've actually got is four strands of thread that I'm working with to attach my buttons onto my coat um, and also I'm now doing a few tacking stitches and making sure that thread is really secure um, within my coat through the main fabric and the lining. Now what I'm going to use is actually a chopstick to help with the gauge of how long my shank needs to be for my buttons and by using a chopstick it's a really good um, it's a really good cheap tool, I have to say, um, to make sure that you actually get a uniformed shank for your buttons if you've got shankless buttons like I have. And I can't deny it is a little bit of a faff trying to thread on and stitch on your buttons around a chopstick and not getting it all muddled up and twisted like I have. Um, but if you can persevere 
and actually get your buttons stitched on um, with your chopstick underneath. It is a really good guide on making sure your shank on all of your buttons is actually um, the same width or you know your shank underneath is the same width. So once we've got that done and I'm doing half a dozen stitches or so um, underneath my button around my chopstick to secure my button to my overcoat um, and then once that is done and I can get my chopstick out of the way um, I should be able to show you how I've just done a couple of little catch stitches underneath just to make sure that that thread is all really secure. Then the next thing I do after I've done those couple of little threads through the bottom of that loop there is that I wrap my thread around the bottom of my button and put my needle through the loop that I've created. I guess this is a little bit like a chain stitch that you would use um, and it just helps to create that shank and to make that shank really secure and again I tend to do half a dozen of these um, before I start to finish off um, with a couple of little tacking stitches underneath again to make sure that my thread is all secure. And if you've actually got buttons that have a shank on them, um, you don't really need to use this method on how I've attached my buttons to my overcoat. It's just that I have gone for shankless buttons. So through part of the sewing process I guess I have to create a shank to allow for that movement in my button so it's very easy for me to open and close my overcoat without ripping any of my fabric or undoing any of that hard work that I have done through creating my beautiful princess coat and once you've completed your last button you are done We've now come to the end of what must seem like an amazing mammoth task. Whether or not you've just watched the um, sew along on how to put together your princess coat or you've actually put together your princess coat through using the sew along and working out how to do some of those really key, slightly more intricate bits that unless you know a little bit about tailoring here and there, um, one does tend to struggle with. So hopefully you've made it to the end and you're excited to be at the end because you've either A, finished your princess coat or B, I've absolutely inspired you to make your princess coat and you've had your pattern forever and you keep looking at it and going, I can't do that, it's too hard, it's too complicated, but actually it's not. So hopefully I've inspired you to take on your princess coat and get on and actually make this really, really gorgeous pattern. When you've finished your gorgeous princess coat, don't forget to share a picture of it here on the Minerva community page for everyone to see because we would absolutely love to see your finished princess coat and don't forget to use the hashtag princess coat or even sew along princess coat would be absolutely brilliant so we can see how many people we have inspired and more importantly helped out to make their princess coat. So I would just like to say, I am Marie, a completely mad seamstress here at the Minerva community and thank you very much for hanging out with me. I hope you have enjoyed my sew along and I shall see you again very soon for some other really exciting content um, that I will be creating here for you exclusively at Minerva. So take care, till next time, sew on, bye!